Hello and welcome to Ancient Game, where we cover all games and show you how to play them. Today I'm going to talk about Hanafuda, the flower card game. If you want to know about its history, then stay with me. If you just want to know how to play, go to this time mark. And without further ado, let's begin with the video. Hanafuda are a kind of Japanese playing cards easily recognizable by their particular design that represents flowers, plants and natural phenomena associated with Japan's fauna and flora, hence the name Hanafuda or flower cards. They appear during the Edo period and developed both from the European Latin branch of playing cards and from traditional Japanese matching games like Keawase and Eawase. But playing cards as we know them were first introduced in Japan by Portuguese traders during the mid 16th century. This doesn't mean, however, that Japanese didn't enjoy before games resembling mechanics traditional described to European playing cards. In fact, some of these games would play a major role in defining both Hanafuda and other Karuta games that survive up to this day. Matching or Awaze games were famous pastimes of the Japanese nobility much before the European expeditions. But instead of playing cards, they would use painted sea cells and drawings. These kind of games were, however, not very popular among common people. Awaze games were practiced in party-like and celebratory events that would involve polite and joyful competition, with every participant trying to bring novelty, surprise or humor with his art. Clearly, commoners were much more driven to the thrill and often rude competition that uh, gambling games offered. And this is something European card games were very good at. The first Japanese decks were modeled after the Portuguese one and are known to historians as Tensho Karuta, named after the Tensho period and the Portuguese name for card, carta. It was a 48 card deck with the tens missing like the Portuguese decks of that period and had the four Latin suits of cups, coins, clubs and swords along with the knave, knight and king. But unfortunately for the European newcomers, the Tokugawa shogunate saw Christianity and the two colonial powers it was most strongly associated with, Spain and Portugal, as genuine threats for Japan's autonomy, integrity and sovereignty. This led, of course, to the famous isolationist Akaku policy that severely limited Japan's cultural and commercial relation with the West for almost 300 years. Playing cards were, of course, no exception, and in 1633 the Tokugawa shogunate banned foreign cards, forcing Japanese manufacturers to radically redesign their cards. Since private gambling was also banned at this time, the scenario turned into a cat-and-mouse game where, in order to hide the prescription of Latin-derived cards, makers turned their cards into very abstract designs, known as Mekuri Karuta. Whenever one deck of cards was banned, another one would come up, until it was banned again. Karuta would consequently develop separately from the rest of the world, and in this context, Hanafuda was finally born. The advantage for Hanafuda was that, unlike many card games in the time, they had non-numeric values or ciphers to represent numbers. The 48 cards of the pack all displayed Japanese traditional imagery, so there was little apparent connection to foreign themes as well. Furthermore, Hanafuda cards could vary greatly in design depending in location or manufacture, and any untrained eye could easily mistake them for innocent cards not suitable for gambling, except for the fact that they were definitely used for gambling. This, for example, is my Hanafuda set that I bought in Japan. Anyone familiar with the game will instantly recognize it as a Hanafuda set. But someone who has never seen it would probably take some time recognizing it's the same game as this one. But of course, Japanese authorities were, however, not completely oblivious to the fact that Hanafuda cards were used for gambling. A fun fact is that the word Hana for Hanafuda can actually mean two different things in Japanese. Flower, as for flower cards, and also nose. This double meaning aided gamblers who could silently tap their nose to indicate their desire to purchase cards or find a gambling group without alerting the authorities. It is rumored that this also helped popularize the long-nosed goblin version of the Tengu as a Hanafuda mascot of sorts. But regardless of the gamblers' efforts, the relentless government bans had taken their toll on the popularity of card games. So Hanafuda didn't take off in a big way. This all changed in 1889 when Nintendo, yes, Nintendo, was specifically founded for the purpose of producing Hanafuda cards. Nintendo's cards sold well, but they were mainly used for gambling, which remained illegal. 
Hanafuda cars would thus gain a strong association with the Yakuza gangsters who ran the gambling prolors. In fact, the word Yakuza comes from the game of Oicho Kabu, which is played with both Kabufuda and Hanafuda cards, and that's why also many Yakuza have tattoos based on designs from Hanafuda. Even today, Hanafuda still retains some of these associations with crime and the underworld, which is why it deters many respectable Japanese people from playing with them. However, this is every day more uncommon since Hanafuda also gained a lot of popularity as a kids and family game. You can even find Mario in it. But that has nothing to do with us. Enough with the history and let's actually learn how to play the game. Well, you can play a lot of games with Hanafuda cards, but today we're going to learn how to play one, if not the most famous game of Hanafuda, Koi Koi. Because of their design, Hanafuda cards can be quite intimidating to newcomers, so I recommend you using cards with cheats like the ones I made for this video. The first thing you want to do is decide the number of rounds you will play. Hanafuda games are typically played over a fixed number of rounds that represent different time lapses during a year. That's why Hanafuda has 12 suits. Each suit represents a different month and displays iconography related to that month, like the cherry tree blossom of March. 12 rounds will be thus the standard game and represents a full year, 6 rounds will be a quick game and represents half a year, and 3 rounds will represent a season and are the fastest game. All players must agree beforehand how many rounds they want to play. Then the dealer is decided. Each player takes a card from the top and the one with the earliest months becomes the dealer. For example, if I draw a card from January and my opponent draws a card from February, I will be playing first. Afterwards, the dealer deals each player 8 cards and puts another 8 cards on the middle of the table, which is also called the field. Each player should now pay attention in case he's dealt 4 cards of the same month or 4 pairs of different months. These are called insta-win combinations and are very rare, but award 6 points to the player who gets any of them and ends the round instantly so it's in your best interest to at least check for them. Both players should also pay attention in case three cards of the same month are dealt on the field. If this happens, all of them are gathered in a single stack, but this is also quite rare. The dealer plays first, with the turn having two phases, capture and lucky draw. In the capture phase, the player will play a card of his hand on top of the card of the field he wants to capture. In order to do this, both cards have to belong to the same month, regardless of their value. If a card is captured this way, the player puts both cards in front of him, separated by their card value. This is important, because both players have to be able to see what cards the opponent has captured so far. If a player can't capture any card this way, or he simply doesn't want to, he must add a card from his hand to the field. In the second phase, or lucky draw, the player will draw a card from the top of the deck and play it in the same way he would do in the capture phase. This means he can capture cards or alternatively place cards on the field as in the previous phase. After this, the turn passes to the other player and the process repeats itself until both players are out of cards or one of them calls sets, which is called shoubu in Japanese. In Koi Koi, like in games like poker, you don't get points based on the card values, but on the sets you manage to complete. These sets are usually memorized, but I suggest you play with a cheat sheet so you don't miss any set you or your opponent makes. This is a list of the different sets you can complete and the different points you're awarded by completing them. I'll cover it at the end, so don't worry about it now and just keep in mind that sets is what you aim for in this game. Right after completing a set, let's say 5 fives, the player must choose between two options. He can call for sets, ending the round and gathering the points, but if he feels like having a chance for gathering more sets in the next turns, he can alternatively call for koi koi, which literally means come on in Japanese, and continue playing. This however can be risky, as if the opponent calls for sets after you have called for koi koi in any turn before, he will get his total score in this round doubled. It is important to notice that you can only call for sets if you complete a set in your turn. You cannot call for sets you have made in other turns. Improving a previous set, however, counts as a different set, so it's up to both players' strategy to decide whether it's intelligent or not to aim for more points or just end the round. Players should also keep in mind that only the player who calls for sets will get points in the round and that if the total score of the sets gathered by a player reaches 7 or more, his final score for that run will be doubled. 
This can lead to very risky situations. Should a player call for Koi Koi with 6 points? Or should he push for one more point so he gets his final score up to 14? If both players run out of cards without having completed a set in their last turn, none of them are awarded any points in this round, regardless of how many sets they have completed in the turns before. So it's in these kind of decisions where lies the beauty of the game. And this will be basically be a round of Koi Koi. Now I will go over the sets you can make using the cheat sheet. But before that, you probably have noticed I have drawn symbols in some cards. For example, usually these 5 value cards wouldn't have any kind of symbols or color band, so in order to make it easier for new players, I added symbols that point out which of them have special properties. The same with the 10 value cards, 20s and the wild card. Many of the sets in this game depend on such cards special properties, so it's very important to learn and recognize them. With that set, these are the sets you can make in Koi Koi. Depending on the source, you can find different point systems, but this is the one I find more interesting. All of these sets have their own name in Japanese, but I think that would be too much information for a new player, so I'll be referring to the card values instead. 520s, awarding 15 points. 420s without the Rain Man, awarding 10 points. 420s with the Rain Man, awarding 8 points. 320s without the Rain Man, awarding 6 points. The Sake Cup with either the Curtain or the Moon, awarding 5 points. The Boar, the Deer and the Butterfly, awarding 6 points. The 3 Blue Scrolls, awarding 6 points. The 3 Red Poetry Scrolls, awarding also 6 points. 5 Tens, awarding 1 point. 5 Fives, awarding 1 point. And 10 Ones, awarding 1 point. Remember as well the two special combinations you can be dealt at the beginning of the game. If you are dealt 4 pairs of matching suits, you get automatically 6 points. The same if you are dealt 4 cards of the same suit. Also remember the multipliers. These are crucial for your strategy. Calling sets after your opponent's Koi Koi equals double your round score. And the same applies if you get 7 or more points in total of your sets. This means, for example, if you get 420s with the Rain Man, so 8 points, you are going to get 16 points at the end of the round. Also notice how I have drawn a plus 1 next to some sets. This means that for each of those sets, having another card of the same value improves that set by 1 point. So for example, if you have 5 fives and then you capture another 5, then you will get another point, so your set will be 2 points instead of 1. And this is basically all there is to know to start playing Koi Koi. There is other minor variants you can play with, but this is important stuff. Don't worry if all these rules sound confusing. I assure you with a couple of games you'll learn the game very very quickly, especially if you use the cheat cards and the cheat sheet. So don't be afraid to try it out and go over the rules again if there's something you didn't catch. And with that said, feel free to like the video if you learned something new and subscribe if you want to learn other old games and how to play them. Until the next time.